Levels, levels. They're good. I nearly just destroyed my microphone. Levels, levels. What is levels, levels? Levels, levels is where you check the levels, Mike. <laughs> you look at the little bars and you see if they go to the edge. Okay. And that's when you've over leveled and you right, have to turn yeah. down the game. You have to turn down the yeah. level. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how microphones work. You just like if it goes red, it's bad. Yeah. And if I. If some of these dials on this mysterious equipment in front of me, like if my leg accidentally touches it and then they move and then the levels are bad and then it sounds bad. So you got to do a levels levels check before you start a podcast. It's probably best to just not have the equipment in the vicinity of your flailing body to amend it. Like I think that might be a good start. There's nothing flailing about my body, but the, you know, it's a it's a very small black booth that I'm recording in here. There's not a lot of space. Like I'm going to I'm going to mm. bump stuff. It's going to happen sometimes. Okay. Anyway, Merry Groundhog Day, Mike. <laughs> Is this the thing that people wish to each other? Yeah, every look, Americans wish each other Merry Groundhog Day. No, I'm sure don't. you must. Yeah, they, yeah, they You're do. lying to me. This is one of those things where, like, then I go I'm and tell other people this. I'm 100 percent not mm. lying to you. Did you know it was Groundhog Day? No. It's it's very culturally insensitive, but yes, Americans say Merry Groundhog Day to each other. And I just wanted to let you know, Puxitoni Phil did not see his shadow, so spring is coming early. Get prepared. There's so many things that I like only tangentially understand about that sentence that you just... <laughs> I don't understand what's not to understand about that sentence, Mike. Like, I un I know who Puxitoni Phil is because of uh, Groundhog Day the movie. Right, right, of course. The one true Groundhog, yes. But I don't get the whole, like, oh, you see the shadow and then why that has anything to do with spring like i just don't understand this yeah but no, that's fine like no one understands that like that's just the magic of the groundhogs like mm. how do you know how does santa know if if you've been good or not well that's that's the magic of santa because he's always watching yeah because he sees you when you're sleeping because he's a creepster <laughs> we all know it the sun tells us he knows when we're awake yeah. So Puxitoni Phil, that's the that's the magic of him. I'm still not convinced that people say Merry Groundhog Day to each other. I still think that you're punking me with this one. I am not. Mm. I wouldn't do that. Okay. Anyway, I, I just like I just wanted to wish you a Merry Groundhog Day and you know, I hope that you you had known, but obviously you didn't. Slack has a new logo. Yeah. Now, when we were preparing for this show, I kind of made reference to this, and you said to me, we are definitely talking about the new Slack logo. Yeah. And it feels like that this this kind of thing fits very neatly into our show. So this was announced a few weeks ago, um, kind of out of the blue, as all these corporate rebrands tend to be. Uh, mm. They have a new logo. They have a blog post. I actually quite like their blog post about the new logo. I think as far as talking about new logos go, they did a good job of it. Like, I think they explained clearly why they wanted to do it. I mean, we can debate or not whether these make any sense as reasons, but I think that, you know, they weren't too fancy about it. They didn't do what Evernote did, right? Where they had like a 10,000 word article showing all the designs. I think they clearly yeah. broke it down. I think Slack are self-aware enough to know that people were going to hate this. They they were like tweeting beforehand and they were kind of just like, all right, everyone get ready to have some opinions, right? Like they, they're self-aware enough as a company and the people that they know that no matter what they did, because that's just how this goes, doesn't matter what you do with a logo rebrand, there will be people that won't like it. There are a lot of people that don't like this one. And I was just kind of keen to understand just just off the bat what your opinion is of Slack's new logo. Well, it looks like a d pinwheel. Now, do you think I th th we're going into one of these situations again where, like, you say a thing and, like, do you think I'm, like, I can't, there's no, like, no one will hear that, right? Because, like, I'm just going to bleep it. Yeah, but just keep the sound of the first letter, Mike. Give me that. Okay. Okay. Yes, sure. I know, I know your sensorious hand is always eager Don't on the button. Don't do this. <laughs> you just can't. You, you say this, then people people make, they say things about me. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, Mike. Because hey, you're not on the internet. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's what it is. I forgot about yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm immune now. I'm immune now, bitch. 
my assumption would like I don't know how you would feel like do you like a dick pinwheel like I'm not sure that the, like you could say it looks like that but is it is that a pleasant image to you I don't know I just think it's funny because when you do a like a rebranding you're always in danger of the thing that you don't see as as the client or the designer and then it gets out there into the world and someone looks at it and you think oh I know what that looks like. It looks like this thing. And that to me is a little bit of the Slack logo. To be fair, uh, I mean, I guess as far as d wheels go, it's not a bad one. Um, <laughs> of all the d wheels I've ever seen in my life, this <laughs> yeah. is probably my favorite. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Like, I figured we just had to mention it on the show because I feel like having torn Evernote to shreds mm -hmm. for their hilarious not at all self-knowing blog post about their deep design process to come up with a logo that looks exactly the same as their existing logo. I feel like the, the Slack one is the total inverse in yes. both directions. Yes, at least they did something different, right? Right. It's, it is definitely a different logo. <laughs> it, it looks different. You did that. You, you definitely made a different one. <laughs> you, yeah. you set out to make a new one and oh boy did you. You did it. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then I agree with you. Uh I don't I don't like the new Slack logo. Um but I will give I as with you, I will give them points for a blog post that doesn't make it feel like they've lost the plot of reality or what people yep. care about. Like they did like you said, they went through, here's a couple of their concerns about colors and angles and how it's represented differently and they brought up a couple of things that i never even really thought about that like the app icon uh doesn't match the logo at all because it's just i've used slack for so long those two things in my head are just what slack are so they went through a reasonable list of complaints as a company about here's why we want mm -hmm. to come up with a new logo and then they're like and here's our new logo i just i think it's kind of a tragedy though because I you know I'm not the first and I won't be the last to say this but I think Slack had great branding yeah. and ultimately like they're just a work chat tool and I think one of the things that made them so incredibly successful was even just like the color scheme that they picked and the the like the friendliness of the logo and everything so so I feel like they lost a real asset by getting rid of their old logo and yeah the new one is just sort of very forgettable and very generic but you know i think that's kind of what they were going for yeah i want to come back to that genericness in a minute because i have some some theories but like so the actual slack logo in the abstract i actually think is a pleasant logo like i, I think it's fine right like if slack launched originally with this logo i don't think it would have made much of a difference because it still has a weird playfulness to it right like it still doesn't look like a lot of things that you see in in corporate design mm -hmm. but it isn't as nice or fun as the old one right like uh, as a as a thing that exists i think it's fine but i do miss what it used to look like a little bit but not so much it doesn't like anger i'm not like, angry about it like i do think that the new app icon is a is a bit more boring Right, that it's mm -hmm. just the logo in a purple square, but this is look. I you know they gave some reasons as to why they're doing this, but I think that they are not talking about the real reason of why they did this. Is Slack is an enterprise company now, and they are make enterprise apps, and they needed a serious logo now. And look at the colors: it's blue, green, red, and yellow, like like Microsoft, like yeah. Google. Right? Like, they didn't even keep the same colors, right? Like, they changed the way that the colors looked. I think that it's very much like, oh, we're, we're serious now. We're a serious company now, and this is our serious logo. They pull a nice little trick uh, with the animated GIF on their page that shows off the new logo, which, if you're not paying attention, makes it look like they've kept the same colors. Mm -hmm. But they have, a little, they have a little animation flourish that hides where they're doing the color transition to the new ones to make it less obvious. They have all four balls of color overlap each other for a split second. It's like, I know why you did that. <laughs> Someone who works with a lot oh, of animation. I can see that now. I know why you had them overlap in the center. You didn't need to do that. <laughs> Damn, that's good. 
Yeah, it's well done. Like it's it's well done because it makes you think that it's not as different as it is different. They're not as fun anymore. Like the red used to be a more like a purpley red, but now it looks like a kind of a regular red to me. Like you know, yeah. there there is some changes going on there. Huh? They've, yeah, because yeah, they've muted it all a little bit, haven't they? I think it's it's less pastelly and more Microsoft like mm-hmm. on, on the on the edge of colors. There, it is super funny when you line them all up. Right, you line up Google and Microsoft and now Slack, and it's just like, what? Like, what is it? Like, someone made a decision, someone did some research at some point where mm-hmm. they were like, oh, well, you've got to stick to the primary colors. Mm-hmm. We all know this because human beings' brains are wired in such a way that the primary colors are this, this, and this, right? Like, you know, somebody did it at some point, right? <laughs> and now everyone knows, ah, oh, you got to stick to the primary colors. Don't go crazy. I don't remember if it was. Google or a researcher at Google, but I remember reading an article about how like they intensely tested all of the colors when they wrote like Google in color letters on the search page. Hmm. And like it did, it did matter when they blued up the blue of the G, and it did matter when they like redded up the red of one of the O's. That it, like it had a measurable effect on hmm. the number of people using the site. So yeah, I like I I presume that that is true. It's an interesting idea that you have that they're that they've done this because they want to be more enterprisey, and I can, I think I can kind of go along with it, but I I don't know, I don't feel like the old logo was too unserious. I feel like it, it hit a really nice balance of being friendly but also not silly. Well, I think part of what's going on, like part of my point is. They don't have a like. It's the 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 reason they want the brand consistency is so it remains like permanent within corporate in the corporate world right like mm-hmm. this is our logo you see that you know what it means and like mm-hmm. and if they keep changing it like they do because it's difficult to represent their the like the the plaid and the overlap in the previous one it waters down their brand which doesn't make them look as strong mm. yeah that's a good point that's a good point I was thinking that you meant it just that they needed a more serious logo like like say, like say for example a company picked a an icon that was a, a hand drawn sketch of a cow's head like that you know that and then you became like an enterprise task management system you you'd want to change that logo i could understand that you would you would think so wouldn't you but some just refuse to do that <laughs> yeah so some are, some are keeping a hand drawn picture of I a wouldn't, cow i wouldn't i wouldn't mind to see years. a 15000 word blog post and remember the milk about them changing their icon i just want them to change it <laughs> right like i don't use the app but i still want them to change the icon that's an interesting point you make though and I, I, that highlights what i thought was the less big deal part of the article about the consistency and representation mm-hmm. so that's i think that's interesting and i'll say like i don't have a problem with this right like the idea of them i think kind of feeling like they maybe need to grow up a little bit like I'm not saying this with like any derision in my voice, right? Like I, I understand, but I just think that that's what's going on. And to me, it just it strikes me as a little sad, just because I feel like it was pretty universally agreed upon that Slack had really great branding. Everybody yeah, felt like, oh, it's really I strong. Mean, th- that was all when we all felt very differently about Slack, right? Like that. Yeah. Ma- I think it mattered more when Slack was this super fun hangout place, but now it's everybody's workplace. So I think well, yeah. that 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 brand association doesn't feel the same to me anymore, anyway. Yeah, well, that's why I also think it's a funny time to do the change because I will also agree that the new icon matches how I feel about yes. Slack much better. Right? It does. Like, it's like, oh, uh-huh. there's the business. Business yeah. happens in the four colors. I know that. Yeah, that's the business app. That's what it is now. Where do we go for the fun stuff? Where does that happen now? Is there is there a replacement? What's the Slack replacement? Uh, I I have no I have no Slack replacement. Slack eats all. That is pitched every day to somebody. You know, <laughs> we're gonna we're the new Slack. We're the replacement for Slack. Maybe email would be the replacement for Slack, and it all it all comes full circle. Chat clients and email are just a like an robberus eating its own tail forever. All roads lead to email. <laughs> this episode of Cortex is brought to you by our friends at Luna Display. Luna Display are the makers of the only hardware solution that will turn your iPad into a wireless display 
for your Mac, which means you will have a second display with you that is super portable with basically zero lag and stunning image quality. Setting up extra screens is a fiddly task, but Luna Display makes this so easy. You plug this beautiful little dongle into the back of your Mac and you are ready to go. Everything works seamlessly over Wi-Fi and then you have a second screen for your Mac on your iPad. You can set it next to your screen on your desk and you have an extra monitor there for whenever you need it. But it also works over USB as well. So imagine you're traveling, maybe you're on a plane, you're on a train, maybe you've been lucky enough to get an extra seat next to you so you can take advantage of some additional desk space. You can just plug your iPad and your Mac together with a USB cable and you'll be able to use your Luna display on your iPad as a second screen. It is absolutely wonderful. And then you have that advantage of extra screen real estate wherever you need it. Luna Display is a complete extension for your Mac. It supports external keyboards on the iPad as well as the Apple Pencil and touch interactions turning your Mac into a touchscreen device. And the all new liquid video engine that Luna Display have developed brings significantly reduced latency and faster screen refresh rate than ever before. I use Luna Display every single day. I have a Mac Mini in my office that doesn't even have a display plugged into it at all. I just have a Luna display plugged into it. So then I'm able to use that Mac Mini as a server for a bunch of tasks at home, but I can also, from wherever I want at home, I can open up the Luna display app on my iPad and get something done quick if I need to on the Mac. So I have a bunch of little tasks that I might need to complete that sometimes iOS can't handle for me, but now I don't need to worry because Mac OS basically lives as an application on my iPad. I absolutely adore my Luna display. If you have an iPad and a Mac, just get one of these things to try it out. It is so freaking cool. Listeners of this show can get an exclusive 10% discount on Luna Display. Just go to lunadisplay.com and enter the promo code Cortex at checkout. That is L U N A D I S P. LAY.com promo code Cortex at checkout for that 10% off. Go there now, upgrade your setup. You're going to love it just like I do. LunarDisplay.com promo code Cortex for 10% off. Our thanks to Luna Display for their support of this show and all of Relay FM. So, one month has been completed in 2019. So, we have started our years with our yearly themes in mind. Yeah. How has Year of Order 2, which is how I'm thinking of it, how has that begun for you? I don't, I don't like Year of Order 2 so much. Year of it's, more order? Yeah. <laughs> it's the Year of Reorder. Ah, uh, yes. I still, personally, I prefer Year of Order 2, but sure, Year of Reorder also works. You can do whatever, you can do whatever works for you, Mike. Yeah, I can call it whatever I want, right? Like, it doesn't matter, but sure. How is the Year of Reorder? I mean, well, maybe a product of the Year of Reorder is there is a new video. Yes. Well, this is a funny thing. I don't know if this has happened before, but we are recording this before the video has gone up. Like, I feel like this has maybe happened maybe once. I don't know. It feels strange. It has happened, I think, at some point in our many year, multi year history of this show, but it's very, it's very rare because, you know. You don't like to share things in advance in case it all breaks and falls down and changes, which I totally understand, but... Yeah, I think it's very reasonable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's very reasonable to not yep. do that. Um, but yes, at the at the time of recording, the video that is currently being animated will be up uh, in two days. Oh, we have done this before because I'm, th- I'm going through the same emotions that I went through last time, okay. which is what you're doing right now. Right. The video that we are talking about, your airplane boarding video, everybody that's listening to this can know that it exists or knows that it exists, but you're still right. talking in the abstract about it. Well, no. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, no, I have... <laughs> right? You did this last time. I don't remember when it was that we did this, but I remember going through it. Oh, yes. You're talking in the abstract about this video as if you're trying to be secretive about it, but it already exists to the whole world by the yes. time they're hearing this. Yes, I'm sorry, listeners. This is very mentally and emotionally confusing. No, it's very uncomfortable for you. It really is. <laughs> and like, so I made a video. It's about boarding an airplane. Mm-hmm. If you're listening to this podcast, you've probably already seen it, I'm yep. guessing. And um, if you haven't, there's a link in the show notes for you to go and watch it. 
Yeah. Although, like, I'm going to make a wild prediction that, like, the the Venn diagram of Cortex listeners and YouTube viewers, like, probably people have seen it. But thank you for the link, Mike. I appreciate the mm-hmm. Google juice. You'd be surprised sometimes, you know, like, I've heard this. This has definitely come up in the past where, like, the, there is, like, a weird order of things. Like, some people are just more interested in Cortex than the YouTube channel. I, I'm sorry to have to tell you that. And there will definitely <laughs> no, be no, people in the Reddit that confirm that, which I always find just super interesting. You never really know the funnel of the, the, what people care about. I also know that this is this is where on the Reddit we'll be hearing from the people who only know us from this podcast and know yeah. nothing of either of our other works, which is also always very strange. Gray makes YouTube videos? <laughs> I thought he was a podcaster. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know you like that joke, Mike. <laughs> what does Wikipedia say? Wikipedia. Let's no, see. I like to check in. Don't stir this up again. Where is it? Like, um, oh, I think it might have switched around. Yep. No. You've got educational YouTuber and podcaster. So they, oh, they've decided like... upon it right now. You're, you're good right now. Okay. I guess my federal land must have put me back in yeah, educational it, it put you YouTuber back on top. status. So the, the video is about boarding an airplane. Mm-hmm. But there's, it's so weird to even talk about it knowing that people will hear this because there's there's a few things it's like one there's always the demon in the back of my mind which is saying like hey don't don't jinx it by talking about it ahead of time there's always potential for last minute disaster sure uh (laughs) and then there's the other there's the other weird thing about i have no idea how it has been received right but you wouldn't know anyway yeah but i would at least (laughs) know the view count so it's it's a little it's a little strange but yeah this was uh this video, which you have seen also, mm-hmm. I sent it to you so that you could mm-hmm. take a look at it. And yeah, this this was very much a, like the first video produced entirely under the year of reorder. It was actually produced under incredibly, incredibly rushed <laughs> and quick circumstances. So that's also why I'm, I'm just a little bit nervous about it. But yeah, basically the year of order began as, as a great year will. With a graycation where I went off to an undisclosed location in Finoscandia. And because of advertiser deadlines, I had basically three weeks from start to finish to create a script and create a video. You didn't even have a script. Okay, look, so there was originally a script for a different thing. Yeah. Because this deadline was set up like six months ago. But the thing that I was working on originally for January uh, turned out to not not be like, like, this is not going to work. But basically, like, locking myself away in an ice palace with nothing else to do in the world mm-hmm. except to write a script under, like, it has to happen in three yeah. weeks period of time. Yep. And that's extraordinarily draining to do. But mm-hmm. I was really happy because, um, like, I was really keeping the year of reorder in mind and there's something great about dramatically narrowing focus and then also trying to be like how do how do i want to do this it's like well i want to try to stay healthy while while i'm doing this i want to try to maintain a regular schedule while i'm doing this i just have like an extraordinarily limited set of activities for the next three weeks it's like i can go i can go to the gym i can take a brief walk outside before i freeze to death i can read about this topic i can write about this topic and those those are basically it like if i'm not doing one of those things i should i should probably be headed back to them so how long was the period of time that you had to write the script i ended up with three weeks where i was basically isolated from the whole world and just worked on this right but during that three week period was there any other work happening on the video was it being animated at the same time no there was there was nothing uh, okay. It was it was just like I had to because here, here's the thing. If I don't have enough of a video to even know, like, what is the idea for what we're going to animate? Is this even the thing? Like, I don't want to just waste the animators time with like, here, I'm, I just just do a bunch of stuff that might be vaguely related to this topic. Right, like, it's not useful in this situation because of the deadline. Didn't you have to do it anyway? Like, no matter how, no matter what happened, were you not kind of bound? Well, you know, you can always fail to meet a deadline, Mike. That's very true. <laughs> you can, I guess. You know, de- just because there's a deadline, it doesn't mean that you meet it. Right? Mm. But, you know, some deadlines are much more important to meet than others. Yeah. So, 
the th- the three weeks was me trying to calculate how much time does the animator also need in order for us to to get this out when it has to be out. So I figured right. like when I emerged from seclusion at the end of the three weeks, I had to walk right into my recording studio here at home, record it, and be able to hand it off in order to get it done in time. So the way that that, that process works then is once you have the script, you record a, a rough version of the audio and send it, and that's when it, they start animating based on what they hear and what, what you know, like to fit that, right? Like that's kind of how that works? The, the main thing is getting an audio track that is almost entirely locked down. Yeah. Like here's, here's what I'm going to say. The only thing that might possibly happen is a last minute cut to one of these lines if we realize like it's, un- okay. it's not so, necessary. So you're in theory recording the final audio. Yeah, I don't ever record like a rough audio huh, okay. draft. I've never done that. It's huh. if I, I am going to have the final audio or I'm not. I guess because the timing's so important, right? Yeah, this is also a, like a workflow process for me where I am very rarely happy with the audio that I record for a video because... There's there's too much of like, I have read this out loud a million times, mm-hmm. and so in my head, I have an idea of what the perfect way to say this thing is, but it's surprisingly hard to do when you're actually recording something. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think there's a, there's a little bit of the, the effect where it's like, you have the idea of the perfect version in your head, but you, you can't express it with your physical mouth made of meat. Have you ever like considered acting classes? I haven't considered acting classes, but I have I have seriously thought about going to a vocal coach or something like yeah. that. Like, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to you know, I wouldn't want to go to like an improv class sure. because then your family disowns you and it's humiliating. <laughs> I don't think that that is necessarily how that goes, but yeah. That's fine. But but I have like I have I have genuinely seriously thought like I wonder if there is a vocal coach in the UK I could talk to. I think it would be beneficial, right? Because you have in your mind a way you want to say it, but you can't produce it. And what that requires is like the ability for you to be able to express a wider range of emotions more easily, right? I guess that's kind of what it boils down to. Like you have a specific way you want to deliver something, but you can't get it out that way because maybe you just don't have the tools, right? Yeah, or like I wouldn't say it's I wouldn't say it's the emotion. Like my videos aren't exactly filled with emotional. Narration. Well, but it is all emotions, though, right? Like the delivery, like you sound happy, you sound scary, right? Like the, you know, it's like that kind of range. I think of it as a rhythm. Like I'm going for a certain kind of rhythm, and that rhythm has like yeah. up and down. I'm going to keep calling it emotion uh, because I think that that perfectly like encapsulates rhythm, it. But I know that you hate that, so better. I'm just going to keep calling it emotions. For okay, now. you go. You go right ahead. <laughs> you just got to learn to express your emotions better. That's all it is. Oh, and you'll be God, fine. Thank you, Mike. That's all you Very have nice. to do. You'll be fine. <laughs> Perfect. The, the thing about the vocal coach is interesting, though, because it, it's been vaguely on my to-do list for, I don't know, about six years. <laughs> and I've never really gotten around to it. I have a similar thing, which is that I have wanted to speak to somebody who can help me train my voice for longevity. Mm. right like what amount of damage am i doing to myself with my job i can't imagine that people are supposed to talk as much as i talk for so long yeah right like i would say like you know i know this might sound weird to people that are listening to this but just think to yourself how often in your day are you locked into 90 minute conversations just like consistent conversations for 90 minutes right yeah. like sometimes i'm doing that two or three times a day i'm having these two person conversations for like a 90 minute 2 hour stretch i don't know if people are supposed to do that right like if mm. you are supposed to talk that much so i've often thought to myself like maybe there's something i should do for my vocal cords but again this is like a thing it's just been in the back of my head Every time I mention it, I hear from very helpful people who have great advice, but I just never do anything about it. Yeah, for sure. And this is this is the thing about like when you make your living with your voice partly. Like for sure, you're damaging your voice in some way by doing that. Yeah, because I know that me and everyone that I work with, if we go to like somewhere that's loud, 
were ruined the next day. It took like two days for our voices to improve. And I know that that wasn't the case when I was younger. And I know that when I go somewhere with like friends that don't do what we do, this isn't so much of a problem for them. <laughs> but like it, every time we go to a conference and if we go to like some loud area, everyone's ruined the next day. Like they can't speak. I actually really love this because it means that now in my life I have an excuse to do the thing that I just want to do anyway, which is go when people away. go yep. when people go to a really loud environment I, I make the mental calculation of like, even if these are people I want to hang out with, it's just not worth it. Like, it's just not worth it to end up screaming uh, or even even talking in an uncomfortably loud way mm-hmm. for a couple of hours. So uh, I, I've definitely been able to be like, OK, well, you guys have fun at dinner. I'm just going home. Like, I'm not going to be here for this well, thing. It's well, what you do it. is you just say, I need to protect my voice. And you hold your throat at the same time. And then people are <laughs> like, I need to protect my voice. Right. Very yeah. important. And then you. Like, That's how people think well of you when you do that kind mm-hmm. of thing. <laughs> well, I'll just say that it kind of doesn't matter if you're bailing. People are always going to have the same impression of you, no matter how you present it to people, probably. You're still yeah, bailing. That's true. That's I wanted true. to go back to something. I wanted to go back to this idea of three weeks, three weeks for the script. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of trying to get my head around if that is not a lot of time or a lot of time. I don't know. Well, how, how are you feeling about this, Mike? I don't. That's just what I mean. I don't know. Like, is three weeks of working on a script in general, is that a lot of time or is it not a lot of time? You know, that's what I can't wrap my head mm-hmm. around. Like, and it's not, I'm not trying to criticize you here. Like, I'm just, no, I'm no, just no. wondering, you know, like I know that you take a very long time to write a lot of the stuff for sometimes like really good reason of like, I want to make sure I have this as correct as I can possibly make it. And that is a very arduous task and you're waiting on professionals to get back to you and stuff like that. But just like as an idea of um, something that I assume a lot of the the research is pretty accessible for a subject like this one. So I can't imagine that you were like specifically waiting on uh, an airplane boarding expert to confirm a script for you, which I know is like a thing that you sometimes will do. So I just wonder is like is three weeks of writing like I, I just don't know if if that is too much or if it's just about right for like a, a 10 minute YouTube video. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. And I just wonder. I don't know. I think with any kind of creative thing, it depends on what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. And if I'm talking about the behind the scenes of, of how how does this video come to pass for a normal video? A great example is the Statue of Liberty video. That kind of project is going to be six weeks at a minimum to do, which which sounds like a crazy amount of time. And there's just writing, you mean? Six weeks of writing? Yeah, six weeks of like writing combined with research. Yep. Like the two, like some people, some people do this. I've, I've tried to do this and it doesn't work as great, but some people try to separate those two phases where they have to say like, I am done researching now and now I'm going to synthesize and write. Hmm. That doesn't work for me. I can see what I, I don't think that would work for me either because I don't know if I would know what I wanted to say. Mm-hmm. And like then I would start going down a train. It's like, oh, well, I need to look into this now. Actually, the way this is a good comparison to, to finish off the, the previous thought about talking about recording the vocals. I am that way with the vocals because I, I have to tell myself, like, I have gone into the booth. I've recorded several takes. I've edited together the best version of these takes. And now it's done. Like I... I cannot think about that as potentially ongoing. Oh, let me re-record a take. Let me do it a little bit better. That I have to wall off in the way that some people wall off their research. But for me, the research is very interweaved with the actual writing. Here's the thing. So the airplane video, why is that able to happen in three weeks for me versus six weeks for me? It's because when I, when I went off to my isolated ice fortress to go work, I really knew that the fastest I have ever been able to write a script is about two weeks. And that is everything has to be perfect. The topic has to be simple and it has to be self-contained. There has to be no possibility for ambiguity in the source material. There has to be no way that it can tangent off into other areas. And so if you think about like a video about how do you board an airplane, it is a known system. It is very right. constrained. You, you, you set yourself up for success with what you picked, right? Well, so the reason I had three weeks is because I knew I have at most one week to find the topic. Oh. Right? I found the topic in four days. Okay. So I spent four days 
looking for something that could work. And so th- this is where when people are like, why does he use Evernote? It's like, well, I've got 100,000 Evernote notes to work through, right? Like there's just tons of stuff. So did you find the topic in your Evernote database? Yes, yeah, this, okay. this was 100% pulled from Evernote. So at some point you saw this somewhere and you were like, yeah. I can make a video about that. Is that like a typical thing for you? Then you just put it in a in in, in Evernote. <sighs> yeah, in in Evernote, I have a, like not folders because of their limit, but tags. I have an enormous number of tags for anything that might ever be a video topic or something that might relate to a video topic. And this is one of those moments where it's like, okay, I'm going to try to dig, and I'm not I'm not digging for. Like, what video do I want to work on next? I'm digging with a very particular target. Like, I know exactly the sort of thing that I'm looking for. And this airplane video is a great example because this, every, like, I already had all of this stuff about airplanes and and boarding. Like, it was already all there in Evernote. But it was there as a tangent to another bigger video. And when I was looking through the notes... In the way that's impossible to know, like you just you just feel that it's right. But I was looking through things, and it's like that's it. Like I'm I'm gonna not make this bigger video that this was originally supposed to be a little side note for. This thing that could have been a side note in another video will work as a full video on its own. And then it's like great, found it after four days. And then it's like turn the research material that you already have into a script that you can record. And then that's just then down to my rhythm writing. And, you know, from from talking to other people who write, I think I just naturally have a very slow rhythm. The the comparison that I think is interesting, well, I think is interesting, but, you know, maybe maybe not so much for the listeners, but for the behind the scenes stuff, like ultimately what I want to have is a video that's a nice self-contained little unit Mm-hmm. and that feels like it flows in an obvious way from start to finish. And in some way, the viewer should perceive the video as a simple thing. Like, in, in some ways, the, the viewer should watch it and be like, oh, that seemed really straightforward. But it's it's not so straightforward when you have a pile of notes and you're trying to think about, like, what is the way to talk about this? And that's why I mentally compare this to the Statue of Liberty video, where... Hopefully someone watches that and they think, what a, what a straightforward, simple little story. But the reason that's a six-week video is because that is a topic that intrinsically has the potential to tangent off in a million directions. It also has a thing that I always hate, which is the, the, the uncertainty of history, right? Like, right. A thing that I shouldn't do, but I did do in that video is like, sometimes when a thing is really hard to find, you want to put it in a video just because... As like going through the goddamn charters for New York and New Jersey's being set up in the 1600s and like digging up the original documents for that kind of stuff is an enormous pain in the butt. Now, of course, the viewer doesn't really care, but but like I had to put that in the Statue of Liberty video because like this cost me, right? Like this cost me a lot to feel like I was satisfied sure. with what the answer is. Like in some ways, the Statue of Liberty video is more satisfying because i feel like i put together a thing and it had the potential to explode all over the place but i feel like i narrowed it down to like a straightforward story that connects from start to finish in a logical way and that's a really difficult task and that's like a six-week task and then producing a video under a deadline like this it's much more constrained there's far fewer of that and it allows me much more to focus on just going through as many iterations of the script as I possibly can. What do I think is the best way to say this sentence? You know, which which section should follow after this other section? So I don't know. Like, that's the longest answer in the world to is three weeks a long time or is it not well, a long time? I mean, but... we have half of the answer, which is it's a short time for you. I mean, yeah. how it actually scales to other people that do similar things. We don't, we don't know. I, I think I know the answer, and I think the answer is that three weeks is a long time. Mm-hmm. But 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 I think it's because you. I don't really know it. I don't really have a delicate way to say this, but like maybe you just spend more time trying to make sure that things are correct than other people. And 
that your videos are probably as good as they are because of that, but then that also allows you the luxury. So it's like a virtuous cycle type thing. You are the type of person who wants things to be correct. So when they're correct and well thought out and thoroughly kind of gone through and, and checked on, it actually makes a really good video. So your videos are successful, which then allows you, it gives you the luxury to spend the time, right? And and th there might be other people who have to make things more frequently who can't go to the level of painstaking detail that you do because they they can't go si like six months without a video. Like they just can't do that. So do you know what? You see what I'm trying to get at? Like that you... Your video, you maybe take longer than other people because you can, and that's because of your style. And your style breeds for success because it's so well considered. Yeah, I don't know. Like part of part of what I was thinking about for the year of reorder, like while I was working on this video, is I was very consciously thinking about the way I make things. And mm. we talked about it a little bit before that I was I was doing the Statue of Liberty and the Federal Land video in a little bit of a different way and. This video as well in a little bit of a different way. And and I feel like I am trying to take ad advantage of the fact that I can spend a bunch of time on on these videos. Uh, like I think I'm, I'm lucky in that sense to have an audience that keeps coming back and is interested in things even if it's I've been away for a while. It's a luxury that you, yeah. you can take advantage of, right? Yeah. It is 100% a, a luxury. I've made in these last three videos a real effort to increase the amount of overlap of research and writing time at the same time. And I feel like that, is, that has been really advantageous and has made for a more like satisfying working experience. I don't know how the airline video is going to end up being received, but the year of reorder, at least in terms of videos, I feel like unofficially starts with the Statue of Liberty video. And now I've ended up with three videos where I'm really pleased with the way they came out. And that's great. Like I can always look at the videos and think, oh, I should have done this differently. Or I can, I can hear where I didn't, I didn't hit the vocal mark that I wanted to hit or all that kind of stuff. But the, the three videos, including the airplane one that's out now, um, I am personally very pleased with the way all of them came out. I'm pleased that the first two I was able to spend all of the time and try to try to dig through a bunch of stuff that I know it doesn't really matter to the viewer, but I think makes the videos better. Actually, I have a, I have a good comparison for this. It's a bit like when I was a, I was a physics teacher. I think it matters to have a teacher who doesn't just know the material that is being taught, but knows things that are around the edges of what's being taught. Like having done a university degree in physics makes me a better secondary school physics teacher and i think there's something about the video production process that's the same way that, that like for a six-week period i know a, a ridiculous amount of information about the statue of liberty even if i only end up ever talking about a small percentage of it those two videos were lots of work in the regular kind of six-week cycle and then i'm pretty pleased with this video that was produced under just about as compressed a cycle as it could be and that's that's very different but i'm also pretty pleased with the way this one came out so i feel like year of order is going going pretty well so far for the videos is there anything from this experience though that you would take forward do you mean the the deadline experience yeah i mean what i'll take forward from it is the thing that uh, has always been the case which is i do not like working under deadline uh <laughs> i don't think it's it's good i know that lots of people find that very productive but i i find that mostly like a a costly thing that it makes sense to do sometimes, but it's it's not a way that I want to work regularly if I don't have to. And and also, it's not a thing that I'd want to do regularly because there are only so many of those kinds of gems in my notes, mm. of like things that I can go through and find and be like, this is a perfectly self-contained little topic. Right, like in an ideal world, you would only ever work for three weeks on a script. Right. Yeah. Like this is it's not like that you want to spend nine, ten, twelve, seventeen, twenty weeks on something. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you just have to. Yeah. If people are thinking there's gonna be videos every three weeks, uh <laughs> it's it's never gonna happen. No. And again, like the three weeks is just the script production process. So 
No, but I, I feel like in part of the year of reorder, I've I've settled something in my mind about the the working process of creating these videos, which has now resulted in three in a row that I'm pretty happy with. Whereas over the past two years, there's a number of videos I can point to, like the video about dying, where it's like, I'm not happy with this video. So far, so good in the year of reorder. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but... Go ahead. The, the year of reorder two may result in more videos than year of reorder one. Well, year of reorder two would be next year, Mike. Oh, That's sorry, the this, year of order year. two. The year of order two will result in, <laughs> in more videos than the original year of order did. Look, I'm not I'm not making any promises, but we can also say that it wouldn't take a lot to uh, outstrip last year. <laughs> well, sure. But but maybe you will be a little bit closer to previous years than last year was. I'll put it this way. I'm really liking having year reorder in my mind, and I'm, I'm very actively trying to keep it in my mind on a bunch of different fronts with a bunch of different things. It's like in that New Year episode where I was trying to express this idea of feeling like a new person who is in this new situation. And one of the things that I'm really focusing on is it's, it's very hard to describe. Again, I'm not a person who likes work, but producing the videos that I am happy about is the most satisfying type of work that I do. And I'm aware that if If it goes for a while where I haven't produced a video that I'm happy with, that's what makes me the most unsatisfied. Like I'm like I'm sort of grumbly about that. So part of the year of reorder is trying to focus on the kinds of work that bring me more satisfaction as opposed to the kinds of work that bring me less satisfaction. And the videos is is highly satisfying work when I feel like it's it's pulled off well at the end. Hello, Cortex listeners. Are you a freelancer? Would you like to save up to 192 hours of busy paperwork? Of course you would. Our friends and your friends at FreshBooks are here to help. FreshBooks dramatically reduces the time it takes for over 10 million people to deal with their paperwork by using FreshBooks' super simple cloud accounting software. When you email a client an invoice, FreshBooks will let you know whether or not the client has seen it, which puts an end to the guessing game about whether or not they got it you know that they got it. And FreshBooks can act a little bit like an assistant on your behalf by automating late payment email reminders. This way, you don't have to compose that awkward email. FreshBooks will handle it for you. This lets you spend less time chasing payments and more time working your magic. If you're listening to this and you haven't tried FreshBooks yet, now is the time. Go to freshbooks.com slash cortex and enter cortex in the how did you hear about us section. This will give you an unrestricted 30-day free trial, no credit card required. That's freshbooks.com slash cortex and enter cortex in the how you heard about us section. If you send out invoices and you want to save some time, this is a thing to do. FreshBooks is for you. Thanks to FreshBooks for their support of this show and all of Relay FM. How about you, Mike? This is Groundhog's Day. It's been a whole month since the start of the year. Mm-hmm. How's your year going so far? How's your theme keeping up? So the the theme's going fine. Um, I've already done a couple of things to to aid in the stabilization, and this is in. I was gonna say, just remind the people, it's year of stability too. It's, no, it's year of stability and year of diversification. They are the two oh, themes that okay. for this year. But although I actually do believe that diversification leads into stability and vice versa so they, <laughs> it's kind of one thing but they there's a couple of different right that's why it's year of stability too because there's two things that are no. the same thing in this year oh, it's a nice try it's a beautiful yin and yang for your mm-hmm. your theme mike diversity sure. and stability uh, <laughs> uh and so you know i i've done a couple of things to that I, sh- I think i should have done a while ago i've changed some scheduling around some of the other shows that i do to to make my overall commitment to some stuff a little bit less i've also handed over some editing tasks to somebody that we work with oh good because there's just a couple of shows that don't necessarily require a heavy edit so and they could be done by another very talented individual so we're doing that right like uh, so I, I have someone I can trust. His name's Jim, and he's brilliant. Um, and so Jim's now working on a couple of different shows for me. Uh, just And this is a couple of reasons. One, for time. Two, for longevity in my hands, mm-hmm. um, which is which is turning into more of a struggle uh, over time. 
Um, mm. Things are mostly under control right now, but I'm just realizing that the RSI that I've had, they weren't, they weren't standalone instances caused by specific mm-hmm. things. This is just a part of my life now. Um, and so I just need to, I just need to work with that. So I'm just making some considerations to try and make some of that mm. stuff easier on me. Um, I'm not sad about this. It just is what it is. And I'm dealing with it, right? Like it's just part of who I am. Yeah. It's, it's like, look, every part of your body is like an engine that's rated for a certain number of revolutions before it starts to fall apart. Mm-hmm. Your vocal cords, your wrists, your shoulders. And it like, it just so happens that your wrists and shoulders have, have lower ratings, but mm-hmm. we're all falling apart every day little bit by little bit so you know (laughs) it's what that is thank you uh so that that's kind of something that i'm doing another thing um is i'm reconsidering some of my journaling so i've spoke about this in the past still doing uh, my journals every day and there was one thing that i picked up from uh the book that we read triggers which was Mm -hmm. daily questions so having a list of things that you ask yourself every day and it was i think like mostly an incredibly complex thing which i adapted some um to, to make it work a bit easier for me and i just had seven questions that i asked myself every day and i gave myself a score from one to five uh for what i wanted to do there Now, I'm thinking about kind of reframing and personally rebranding what this is. Mm -hmm. So I've started to think about daily themes Mm -hmm. as opposed to daily questions. And instead of having a question that I ask myself, I just have a word. And Mm. am I doing something that led us up to that word, that daily theme? And Mm. it still leads into the same idea for me of like, if I do something in these seven areas every day, no matter how I feel, no matter what is happening, I am doing things that ladder towards making my year successful and my business successful and my relationships successful. Do you have a specific example of what a daily theme is? Well, I can read you all seven of my daily questions. They're the same as they were before. I didn't want to pry and ask for all of them, but if you're, if yeah. you're willing to go through all of them, I'd be very happy to hear them. See, because they started as questions and then they kind of changed to prompts anyway. So I'm figuring to like kind of make that the final kind of move into just making them like seven words, but be creative, advance Mm -hmm. new ideas, generate revenue, make colleagues feel valued, do good for Adina, engage with my audience and improve my health. Mm -hmm. So I think I can turn these into seven words, right? Right. Creativity. So I'm stuck already, but like, you know, <laughs> so confident and fell. I can do it. I, can do it. I haven't done it. Right. I could do it. I just need to think. So like, you know, I could do that creativity. I can't think of one for number two yet, but like, I just have revenue, you know, just like, <laughs> yeah, you, whatever. I can come up with seven words. All right. Leave me alone. I just haven't done yeah, it yet. No, no, no. It's, it's fine. It's fine. You'll have charity industry. Yeah. There's plenty of words to describe. Plenty of things. words. Like it's, there's, there's a whole dictionary I can pick from. But so my thinking is just to just make that a little bit more simple mm-hmm. um, to, to actually match something else that I've done. So I have changed the way that I kind of score myself for these things from a system of one to five to zero to one. So I was g- having to give myself a score every day. Like, what is a, a score four for generate revenue? Like, what does that mean? Right? Like, what is a five? What is a two? Right? Like, it was, that was pointless to me. Like, it ended up becoming a frustration. Yeah. Yeah. I've always hated that, too. Like, like, like what does that mean? Yeah. Like, cause, like, what is a two? What is a two? Like, basically, it was either zero, three, or five. That was all I was giving myself, basically, <laughs> for everything every day. So right. I had like a maximum score of 35 points for each day. So I've changed it to, I say zero to one, but I'm using a, a notebook that's a grid. Mm -hmm. And I do three things. I either leave the grid blank, I color half of it, or I color all of it. Mm -hmm. And that is either 0, 0.5, or 1. So I kind of now, I will go through and I will color in the grids as I should for each question. And then I write down the number out of 7. I just add up what's there and do it out of 7. And what I've noticed is I feel better about it because I get closer to 7 more than I got close to 35. Right. 
And this is not like my whole point of this, my, my idea for my daily themes is not to be punishing myself. Like this is something that I've been starting to, to realize where I'm like, oh man, like I only got 20 today. Like mm-hmm. that's not what I'm trying to get out of this. Like I'm not trying to like really stringently grade myself. It's more about having a contribution towards each of these things every day is what I want to achieve in my day. Yeah, that's a much better way to think about it. Ha- like, Has progress been made yeah. in this category? And the idea of giving myself a four or a five is like a punishment. Like it's it's silly to me. Yeah, and it is the over-precise rating system. Yeah. <laughs> like, but people ask you to rate a thing from one to 10. It's like, well, the score is meaningless. You know, mm-hmm. this, this, it's, it's frustrating. And like, I always find those things frustrating as well because you just, you know, it's, inconsistent whereas doing the thing where you can fill in a full box or a half box is much more humanly understandable like Mm -hmm. i did nothing i did something or i had like i had an amazing day in this in this category and that like that's i'll give you an example i'll give you an example with with revenue revenue is a good is like a really easy one for me to for me to give an example for so if i haven't called it in i didn't do anything i didn't email anybody i didn't sign any contracts i didn't do anything um, if I've if I've done something where I've like I've contacted some people or I've replied to some emails, I'm working on a deal. That's like half. But if I've mm-hmm. actually made some money for my company today, I'm gonna color that whole thing in. And there's something else that I've noticed that I've given myself some credit for, which I didn't before. If I'm sending invoices, that is part of the revenue process. Like I have to actually send the invoices, right? Right. But I wasn't grading myself in that before. <laughs> Like that didn't count, but like, but that is where the money comes from. <laughs> Invoices are the vital final yeah. hurdle. <laughs> but like, for some reason, in my previous five point rating system, that didn't come into it. But now I would color my square because, like, yeah, I did something to this today. Like, sure, I didn't close a new deal, but I've sent the invoice. Like, that's important. So mm-hmm. I feel like it's allowing me to be a little bit easier on myself, which. That's what I'm trying to do with all of this journaling stuff that I've been doing for the last nearly a year now. It's I'm not trying to test or punish myself. It's to give myself a little bit of leeway, right? Like it's to pat myself on the back in ways that other people can't understand to do. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows how my job works. No one can understand it in full. Only I can. So only I am the person who can say, you did a good job today. Right, because nobody, my job doesn't really. No, nobody else in the yeah. world has my job. It because there just aren't enough people doing it. Yeah, it sounds funny, but it is completely true. Especially like you when when you're running a like a company and there's people and there's all all that like you're the only person who can make the measurement of have have you mm-hmm. done well on this and this isn't a mic thing it's the same thing you do nobody in the world has your job either right like it's we have weird jobs that we created for ourselves in industries that are new uh and there just aren't a lot of people doing them yet but also ultimately like there's there's only one relay mm-hmm. and like you know even even if even if more podcast networks pop up you know you're still you're still the only person who's in charge of relay and you you have to make that call about how well you've done on a particular thing. So mm-hmm. I think this sounds this sounds like a good shift in the journal for you to make it more more a positive thing yeah. than a than a like oh I scored low kind of thing. And the daily theme is good. You know, themes they go all the way up and they go all the way down from big to small. Yeah, I, I like it. I, yeah, I like it. It's just a nice way to reframe it, and it's making me think a little bit differently again. You know, under this new scoring system, I have had days where I felt bad. I just didn't feel like I had a good day, but I scored pretty high. Mm-hmm. So it's like, hmm, okay, because previously that wasn't the case. So maybe the tying with general emotional feeling and productivity is not exactly what I thought it was. So let's, you know, it's, it's allowing me to kind of just reframe some stuff, which I think is, is valuable. And this, my daily themes idea here is very much in its infancy. So my seven questions might change. I might end up with more. I might end up with less. Like I'm kind of, the numbers came first. And now mm-hmm. as we're entering a new month, the way that my book works, I have to write out my seven 
questions again onto mm-hmm. the paper so I can easily score myself. So now I'm getting ready to write those out. I'm like, hmm, maybe I just change those to single words. And then maybe in March or in April, they increase or decrease or change. Like I'm, I'm kind of going through a process now of my journaling is now following up with my year theme change, right? Like that, that seems to what I've noticed that takes maybe a little bit longer to kind of manifest itself for me. So in the year of diversification included the announcement of our company, Cortex Brand. Cortex Brand. Everybody knows about it now. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the big things that we did was open up our email address for people to contact us to let us know the types of things they might want to see and or, which has been very interesting, for people that make things to share their ideas. So again, I will say it's business at cortexbrand.com. I want to hear from you if you have a product that you make and you think would fit with what we're doing or you think fits with the type of people that me and Gray are. Or if you are a designer, a product designer, a fashion designer, like I want to hear from you. Even if you don't even necessarily think you have an idea right now, I just want to hear from you so I can put your name into a folder and then maybe one day we could talk. Like I just want to hear from people because it's been fascinating so far. Um, I've opened myself up to a lot of email, which is fine. (laughs) I knew this was going to happen, right? But, um, you know, I've done a couple of things. I'm using a completely separate email app. I'm using Outlook for this, which I don't use for my personal email. Oh, very businessy. That's can't get any more corporate than that. I think Outlook is the second best email app that I've tried. Right, like mm-hmm. it is. It is. It was. It was one I used for a long time, and I, it's nice. It looks nice. It has some cool features. It works pretty well for what I want to do. It does a weird thing, which I like for this, where it kind of seems to try and like calm down the friction of replying to an email. Hmm. So when you open an email, there's just a text box in the bottom. So when you're reading it, it's just there, and you just type into it like it's a message thread. Oh, interesting. So it looks that's a, more... That's a very interesting UI decision. It is. So it's making me more frequently replying to emails because it feels more like a chat than an email. So right. I like it for that. Um, so I've been enjoying that. And you know what? It feels really good. This feels like an honest-to-goodness side project, and I am so <laughs> happy with it because it is not at all like anything else I do. The type of people that I'm talking to, the types of ideas that we're having, it is very side businessy, and I like that. And so I'm, I am. This is going to be a very slow-moving beast because yes. product design and product manufacturing is slow. And we are talking about this now because we believe it will be interesting as this continues to progress to have this to talk about on the show. So kind of like from an update perspective, we have some ideas for products that predated the creation of this company. Mm -hmm. And we are working on those now. Um, So over the next couple of months, we hope that we'll be able to share some of the behind the scenes of what it's taken to make these products but we don't want to necessarily talk about them until we see a prototype for them in case we change our mind. I think that's pretty fair, right? Like yeah. once we know what they are and once we know we can make them, we want to talk all about what it's taken to make this stuff. But we don't want to talk about something in case we actually can't do it. And if yeah. if it turns out that we have products that fail, maybe we'll talk about those too. But we want to know if it's going to fail or succeed just to be made before we share it. Yeah, it's... It is it is astonishing how difficult and time consuming physical manufacturing in the in oh the boy. real world is. Oh boy. Is it slow? My gosh. It's very different. <laughs> yeah. It like this is a thing you may hear people on podcasts talk about sometimes, but like unless you get involved in it, it is it is just mind blowing how long things can take, how complicated it can be, mm-hmm. and the, the, the iterations and physical products that you need to do in order to try to get something the way that you like it. Th- this is why, like, when you support a Kickstarter, whatever date they say it's going to ship, just add two years to that date. <laughs> and yeah. it's not, like, it's not because people are lying. It's because even if you think you are being the most pessimistic you can possibly be about 
how long it is going to take, there, there, you are guaranteed to have tremendous unexpected delays. Mm-hmm. And it's just going to happen. But yeah, the, the, the world of physical goods, it, it's nice because you have a, like a physical thing, uh, like an object that, that you can use or that you love or that is useful. But my God, like the amount of effort that goes into creating these things is, is astounding. And, and really like my tiny dabbling in physical goods really makes me stand in, in awe of companies like Apple, where it's like, oh, they've got to make 20 bazillion phones, Mm -hmm. right? It's like, I can't even begin to conceive of how that happens because like the tiny projects I've been involved in, it's like, how on earth does this take so long? This should be very simple, but it, but it isn't. But yeah, I would say we are very, very lucky that we have friends that do this stuff for a living already. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. That are helping me in navigating manufacture for the first time. Yeah. Because otherwise this would have been an absolute disaster. <laughs> it would have been so bad. Um, but the fact that we have, you know, we have a company like Cotton Bureau that we work with. And then, you know, I have, so I do, you know, I have a podcast with my, about pens with my friend Brad Dowdy. I actually have a podcast about product design with my friends, Dan and Tom, who run Studio Neat. Mm-hmm. And they are really helping me understand what this takes and they're like very good sources for me in understanding what it what it requires to deal with something being manufactured and how long that can take like i would say this our first product that we're hoping will be for sale at some point this year has felt like it's two weeks away for about 12 months yeah yeah that is that is completely fair Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah yeah it's felt like it's two weeks away for 12 months that's that is just about right it's like Mm -hmm. oh at at any moment we can, can we can release it, and I don't. It's like, listener, listener. I just don't know how to convey with words that feeling of like, oh, this thing is going to be at any moment, and you live with that feeling for a year. <laughs> it's so it's so strange, and yeah, it like it messes with your brain, uh, and I, and I completely agree agree with you. Without. Without knowing people who are already in in this world, I, I would find physical manufacturing of like the stuff that we're doing just totally impossible. Yeah, I don't. Right? I don't think we ever would have done it because, yeah. like, I feel like it would have just been too insurmountable. Like, I never would have allowed myself to have these ideas if I didn't have people that I knew I could ask questions to. Yeah, you know, like it. it this is it's very it's very difficult and it's full of pitfalls and like it's just. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. But my hope would be, and my assumption would be, the more we do this, the better we'll get at it. And it, yeah. we'll understand things a lot more. We'll get our processes in place and we'll understand what we want to what we wanna do. Because we have one-off ideas. We have ideas that are, are bigger, that are longer spanning. Stuff like the um, the subtlety. Mm-hmm. So I'll say like that, has, I've gotten such great feedback about that. Um, like I'm planning like that we will have a line at some point mm-hmm. of products that look like that. Like we have currently the original line, which is available at cortexmerch.com that Go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. <laughs> <You're talking. laughs> that like the so that that line we have the original <laughs> line, which just is like the stuff that just is our regular logo. And I want to have other lines. So I want to have a subtle line which has more products in it. And one of the things that's been really great People have been emailing business at cortexbrand.com and telling me what they want to see. So I have a good kind of barometer for the types of stuff that people might want to see along those sort of lines too. So I'm very excited about all of this because I feel like I have a little project again and I have I feel like I haven't had one of those in about six years. So that's nice. Yeah, it's and it's really interesting. I, I, again, if, if... Since this is at such the beginning phase I, I really do encourage people to send in emails because it's just it's like it's the start of it and we don't know where it's going to go and like you, you've shown me some of the things that have come through and we've discussed it and it's like oh i never would have thought about that but that's an interesting idea mm-hmm. and and so like the the direction of this thing like we have an idea of where we want to go but it's really interesting to see things that other people might want to do with us that we would never have mm-hmm. considered 
And so no. that like that's why that email address exists there is is a doorway to the novel and the unexpected or the the unconsidered on our part. So mm-hmm. if you if you have an idea, please send it in. Maybe we'll work together. And I will tell you, multiple people have emailed me wanting the thing that we're making, which is a good feeling. <laughs> okay, yeah. You're such a tease, Mike. Like, well, you know, th- this is this. I don't. I, I don't feel so bad about teasing with this because we will tell people what it is once we get there. Yeah, and it's only two weeks away. <laughs> always, it's always two weeks away. So don't worry about it. In two weeks' time, there will be another two weeks. <laughs> I do really feel like it's not that far away right now. Yeah, I do too. But, but I have yeah. felt that for about a year. But that feeling is a lie. You just you can't trust yeah. that feeling. <laughs> At the moment, we are about two weeks away from putting an order in. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> This episode of Cortex is brought to you by our friends at HelloFresh, the meal kit delivery service that shop, plan, and deliver step-by-step recipes and pre-measured ingredients right to your door so you can just cook, eat, and enjoy. Achieving your 2019 goals or themes can be as easy as enjoying delicious, home-cooked meals of HelloFresh. Spend less time meal planning, less time grocery shopping, and get that time back to do more of what you love. All of HelloFresh's recipes come together in 30 minutes tops. They need less than two pots and pans and have minimal cleanup, which is wonderful. So you can get out of that recipe rut and start cooking outside of your comfort zone by discovering new, delicious recipes. And that is exactly what happened to me when I tried HelloFresh for the first time about three years ago. I was not a good cook, and I didn't have... Uh, Let's say I was a picky eater is probably a good way to put it. But with HelloFresh's wonderful recipes that were easy to put together and were super enticing that allowed me to make them at home, I could customize things if I wanted to. Like if there was something that I wasn't sure if I was going to like, I could maybe put in a little bit of this or a little bit of that so I could get the flavor of it. And then over time, I built my palate and my skills, so I enjoy way more food now than I ever did before. So I have so much more of a varied diet, and I know how to cook a bunch of stuff as well. HelloFresh quite literally changed my life. There is no hyperbole in that. It really, really did. And I think it can maybe do the same for you too. Take advantage of HelloFresh's special offer for 2019. Get $80 off your first month by going to HelloFresh.com slash Cortex80 and enter Cortex80 at checkout. That is HelloFresh.com slash C-O-R-T-E-X-8-0. Promo code Cortex80. Do it right now. Our thanks to HelloFresh for their support of this show and all of Relay FM. Probably the most important follow-up of, the, of Cortex's history. I'm still using Evernote, and I can't believe I'm about to say this, but I'm so happy with it. <laughs> it's so weird. I feel <laughs> like I'm betraying myself at this point, but we, I was right You know, when we found it. Evernote is exactly what I was looking for for the Cortex brand project. So right. that was what it was. So the idea of why Evernote works so well and why I couldn't find what I wanted is it's a couple of things that I want to keep track of so start ideas for our clothing lines ideas for in general right like just little random things that pop up that aren't something i want to explore right now but i want to save for later Mm -hmm. for our like the all of the different products that we want to make i can set up notebooks for all of them and then have notes within those notebooks which can either be text notes that i've taken um web pages that i'm saving Obviously, what something that Evernote is very good for is mixed media within a note. Like I have one note that has links, text, and a, like a picture that I drew, mm-hmm. right? To try and outline the way that I wanted something to look. It still has its foibles. And like some of Evernote's foibles, I can see are like decisions that they made. So like, for example, when you use iOS or you use the Evernote web clipper in browsers, when you want to save a URL into an Evernote note, what Evernote helpfully does is tries to save the HTML of the web page. There are benefits to this because then you end up with all of the content. So if the web page ever changes, you still have the content. But of course, Evernote is not a web browser, so it never looks right. Mm-hmm. It's always weird and wonky. So I made a shortcut for on iOS that just creates a new note wherever I want to save it with the URL and a title. Because it's super easy to do. Mike, 
You're blowing my goddamn mind right now. This is I'll share the shortcut. <laughs> like, you need to share the shortcut because this has been on iOS one of my frustrations with them. But this is mm-hmm. like you know what you know this moment I'm having here as well. This is still the boundless frontier of shortcuts where it just didn't even occur to me that of course I could make a shortcut to just grab the URL to then put it in Evernote instead of trying to do the HTML web page. Mm-hmm. Ah, this is great. I f- this is I'll give it to you. Ah, I feel like a horizon has just uh, because opened Evernote's up. <laughs> shortcut support is very good. They have lots of different things you can do with it. So the new Evernote as well is relatively lightweight. Look, it's still weird in a bunch of places. Like sometimes it does things and I'm like, Evernote, why are you doing this? Like, you know, like I go to enter some text in and everything just moves a little bit. Like, what are mm-hmm. you doing? Why are you doing this? So, but it is exactly perfect right now for what I need, yeah. which I cannot believe that somehow <laughs> Evernote is back in my life. It's back on my home screen. Oh, wow. Like, on the home screen. Uh, yeah. That's great. I, I need it to be there. It's because, you know, it is where Cortex brand lives for me. Right. So, you know, like it, it is doing a good job for me right now. And I'm genuinely very, very surprised about this. <laughs> I kind of can't believe that, Mike. <laughs> it's so beautiful, really, when you think about it, right? That we're back here again. But yeah. here I am, Evernote. It's 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 back in my life in a big way. But guess what? I still don't use Work Chat. Oh, you don't use Work Chat. Don't work, don't use it. I don't expect to use it either. You know, you know what the, the crazy thing was? I was actually in a situation where I was thinking, oh, maybe I should use Evernote Work Chat for this. <laughs> I was like, no, wait a minute. No, no, there's got to be a better way. But it did, has to be. <laughs> there was a there's a, a, a change in workflow where I, where I was thinking for a second, is Evernote Work Chat the solution to this problem? I was like, no, no, I refuse. I refuse. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's. I think it's funny that you're on the Evernote train. And like for, for a company, I think it is fair to say we have given a lot of kicking to over our time here at Cortex. Uh, you know, like, like I said at the beginning of the show, because of because of Evernote, like I have a video this month because they've been keeping track of everything I've been putting in them for seven years now at this point. Oh, shit. I what? just realized. What? Work chat probably is a good idea for this. <laughs> oh, God damn it. Right, because I have valued the realization of conversation silos. Mm-hmm. Yes, this is the thing we've spoken important. about a bunch. And it's something that Spark allows me to do with email, with our sales manager, Kerry, right? Like we can have conversations about the emails. Well, maybe me and you should be having our Cortex brand conversations in work chat. Ugh. Oh, that is that is a pretty good, I mean, that's the most sensible silo. I think that is the thing that actually makes the most sense to do. God f***ing damn it. Evernote. <laughs> Evernote. It always gets you. <laughs> you got your back. Uh, but now I've never used Work Chat before. So you're back with a vengeance. Now you're sucking me in further than you ever have. All right. Yeah. So expect some invitations from me, Gray, to some notebooks. You can't escape the trunk. The trunk is always going to get you. It never forgets. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Mike, you were able to go somewhere. I was sadly mm-hmm. not able to go. And I, I want to know, how was PodCon 2? This is an actual 2, by the way. This is yeah. for real 2. <laughs> for real 2. Yeah, this is a real one. It's not a joke. It actually is PodCon 2. It's not mm-hmm. like Year of Stability 2. I was genuinely surprised that PodCon 2 was able to do something that many events that I've been to have not been able to do. Mm-hmm. The second one was better than the first one. Mm. So it was better in a bunch of ways. It was better for me personally and professionally, Mm -hmm. um, but it was also just a, I think it was a better run event. The the convention center was more effectively used. They used less of the convention center. So there were more people there for sure, but it was less spread out, which I liked. Because last time there was kind of some things happening over here and some things happening over here. And it was like multiple minutes of walking to get from this talk to this talk. This time Uh. it was much more contained within the convention center. So you didn't have to move around so much to get to where you needed to be. So that was really good, right? Because it just felt like everything was kind of more accessible, Mm -hmm. which I enjoyed. The content was balanced really nicely. I very much enjoyed the panels that I was a part of. They were they were very different, um, and I, I liked them a lot, right? So I did one, which was a panel about 
kind of forgotten podcast ideas. So here's some ideas that I have that I'd never made. <laughs> so everybody in the panel was sharing stuff. But then also we got a lot of audience participation in that one for ideas that people had for podcasts they want to make but couldn't make them and they weren't sure why. And then we could talk about that. So that was really fun. And then I was also part of a panel about origin stories, which was, I loved it. Um, it was, I think there were six of us talking about how we got started in podcasting and how we got to where we are. Mm -hmm. And it ended up being this really emotional panel hmm. because people were sharing their stories. There's a lot of people, you know, I, th I think probably many of our listeners can kind of feel this way of like sometimes a lot of creative endeavors come out with some frustration or there is yep. a lot of rejection leading up to any success. So it was fascinating to talk about that stuff. Um, I will say nobody has asked me to do this, but it is possible to buy a digital pass to the conference still where you can hear the panels. Hmm. So that is available if people want to do that. Um, I am very much looking forward to listening back to some of my panels, but also a bunch of the stuff that I missed. There's like a lot of panels that I would have liked to go to, but I had a busy couple of days, so couldn't get to where I was actually doing more at this podcon than the previous one. So I, I, I like last time I had some time to go and sit in some panels, but this time I didn't. I was going to say, you sound like you were a lot busier at this time. Yeah, yeah, I was, especially most of my stuff was on Sunday. So Sunday was kind of like my feet didn't touch the ground for a while. <laughs> Because they were carrying you around uh, from from place to place. Like yeah, that. they, they, that's one of the best things about this podcast is they have these thrones that they carry right. you around in. It was really nice of them to be able to do that for me. That is quite an upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> you just like take it around like an emperor from uh, from talk to talk. It's really nice of them. Yeah, I mean that that is it is for me a pretty big selling feature for PodCon three. If they're yeah, yeah, you should, again, like. they have a nice one for you, so don't worry about <laughs> it. They actually already had it there with your name on it, hoping that you would arrive. Oh, fantastic! Didn't. Now, like, okay, panels, conference, that's great. Yep. But Mike, Mike, you know what I really want to know about mm -hmm. is the signing. How did the signing go? I didn't f it up this time. <laughs> oh, okay. So that was good. I didn't. Right. I didn't ruin anybody's day uh -huh. uh, on this on this signing. Um, if anything, at the beginning, I was moving too fast. Uh, so, but I was I was much better. I told the the lovely volunteer who was working with me. I was like, "You you must must tell me how long I'm taking, right? Like, right. if we get a quarter of the way through this and I'm not moving at the speed that I should be moving at, I I really I said to him like it wasn't good for me last year. So you need to uh, you you have to keep on at me. Um, and he he was he understood that and we worked well together and he was keeping me a check of my time and I got through everyone just at the right amount of time. Oh good. I think there was definitely more people at my signing this year, which I was very thankful of. And I can only assume it was because people wanted to get their hands on that sweet, sweet poster. Um I will now share in our show notes what my poster looked like um, because that's, that feels fair. Uh, they are not available, mm -hmm. but uh, you can see it. Um, I love this poster more than the original somehow. I don't know how I could have loved it more, but I do. It is as a, you should go see it. It will be in the show notes, but basically it's me in an impossible flying machine flying into seattle mm -hmm. i think i mentioned last time that the kind of the idea was like a movie sequel right like a sequel like it's the second time um and cj who i work with on these kind of went for a miyazaki look in so like miyazaki's like uh, my neighbor totoro and movies like that right like where it's the colors are quite faded i think mm -hmm. that was like kind of what he was going for which has led to something very beautiful and all of my podcast co-hosts are featured in this uh, in this poster, which is amazing. Um, you're in there yep. as a little robot. I love it. There's a whole array, there's an array of of Macs and iPads behind mm -hmm. you, and all of your mm -hmm. co-hosts are featured on there. I mean, it's it's quite impressive considering how many people has to be squeezed into this frame. Uh, it's yep. it's a good accomplishment. Yeah, I didn't ask for that. Like again, like all of this stuff is a surprise to me, really. I just give CJ like the most limited, like, oh, I want another one. And it kind of be like a sequel. Thank you. And then mm -hmm. he comes back with like a bunch of amazing roots. And this was one, this was a situation that I have learned kind of in working with creative people. So when he provided me with his options, 
I could tell that this was the one he was most excited about. Mm -hmm. And I have learned in working with artists and creative people of this ilk, if somebody seems excited about something and you like it, always go with that option. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because they will create the best work that way. So, like, that is, I will give that to our listeners as a tip. If you ever work with anybody in a creative field like this, if they give you an inclination that there is a specific route of the options that they give you that they are most excited about, always go with that one because that will produce the best work. Because people, creative people, if they're excited about something, they will pour more of themselves into it, I think. Yeah. And in, and in my experience, like, it just, it makes everybody happier because. Yeah. For a project like this, where it's like, well, well, you're not actually making a Miyazaki film, right? You you need a you need a poster, and mm -hmm. so that doesn't have like you don't really need specific design guidelines. Like it doesn't have to fit this. You're asking someone like to give of themselves creatively to make a thing, and yep. so like it just it works better for both parties. Where if you don't need something specific, and there's something that the creative person is excited about that they think is a great version, like, like almost always you should go with that because mm -hmm. it's just like everybody's happier. You get a thing where the other person is thinking about it a lot. And so they're, they're working through in their mind what the best way to show this off creatively is. And, and it's just a, like, it's a better final product and it's a better thing to make for the creative person as well. So yeah, it's, you don't always have that kind of freedom, but when you do, no. you should totally take advantage of it. I can be difficult, but in that when I work with people to create artistic things, like you know, visual things, I try and give as little brief as possible mm -hmm. most of the time, which can be tricky, but in my experience, it tends to work out for the best. Mm -hmm. Unless I need something very specifically, which is very rare, um, I feel like... I, I I am able to receive better work for that because in that way I am I am trusting the person who I believe in creatively to access their creativity and mm -hmm. to use that because that's why I'm working with these people is I, I, I want to be able to benefit from their creative mind and their skills. So I just feel like sometimes if you just can give very basic parameters around something you will always end up with something beautiful and like one of the greatest artistic collaborations of my career is with our uh, podcast art designer simon mm. you know simon is an incredible designer who's very talented and does a lot of wonderful work and we brief him so kind of basically you know, a lot of the time it's like, this is the name of the show and this is what the show's about. And then he'll go away and come up with something beautiful. Yeah. Every, every time hit out of the park. <laughs> yeah. So I find if you can find someone like that, it's benef it's I just find it to be very beneficial, you know, like to be able to find relationships like that where you can work with someone creatively in that way so when you when you find someone like that if you need that i think it's very beneficial to everybody to be able to like to not like pen them in to a specific mm. thing right like yeah so that, that's kind of a tangent to be like this post is beautiful and i love it <laughs> uh the signing was great i signed way more devices this time lots of ipads signed lots of ipads i love signing ipads now now i'm over the fear of it Oh boy, do I love signing an iPad. At least with an iPad, you have more space. It feels like yeah. you're, not, you're not so cramped as with a phone. Mm hmm. iPads are good, though. I like signing iPads. And I have a fun, fun story. So mm -hmm. I had a terrible time last year with overrunning uh, my signing. And I was working with a lovely volunteer who I think I ruined their day <laughs> as I moved way too slowly through my signing spending way too much time with everybody and bumping up against the very important signing that was occurring after me. It was a, a disaster. It was fun, but I feel like I made this person's day very difficult. Mm -hmm. So I had a creator chat, which is where me and 12 people go into a room for an hour and we sit and talk. 
and uh, I wasn't really keeping track of the time. I was kind of like just glancing at my watch every now and then, and I kind of thought that I was like, I don't know, like three quarters of the way through or whatever. And uh, it turned out that I was significantly overrunning my time. Mm -hmm. Can you guess who walked in the room to tell me that I was significantly overrunning my time? It was the volunteer from my signing the previous year. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I feel like and I said it to to this to this lady like I feel like I am just ruining your life like I am always here to cause you problems and it was hilarious because she wasn't the person that I was dealing with when I went into the room right it was just the person who had to come in and say you're making things difficult again <laughs> it was just when you were a problem she was summoned yeah <laughs> she's the only person that can deal with me maybe i don't know it's like look you've done it before you've got to get this guy to wrap up <laughs> but it was kind of a wonderful moment to me when she walked in the room and i was like oh no i've done it again <laughs> <laughs> poor mike but podcom was brilliant like one of the things for me personally this time this convention is also full of podcasters who i greatly respect and whose shows I listen to every single week. So it's like a fun thing for me Mm -hmm. that I get to interact with these people. Um, But last year was very much like it was the first time I got to meet anyone, and I was also like maybe this is the only time I ever get to meet these people. So like there was a lot kind of wrapped up for me of like, uh, you know, like this social interaction thing. Like, do I tell these people how much I appreciate them because it's the only time I'll ever meet them? And then mm-hmm. I felt really awkward the whole time. This time, I didn't go into the to the convention feeling that way because I'd already met a lot of these people. So I ended up being able to have much better conversations and interactions with everyone because I wasn't so socially awkward. Mm -hmm. So that was nice. That was a nice feeling. And I got to meet like a bunch of really amazing creators. Uh, I had some wonderful conversations with people. Overall, it was just a much better experience because one, I felt more comfortable and two, they just did a great job of making a second run at this. And uh, I really hope that there's more podcasts and that they'll keep inviting me because... I think stuff like this should exist for our industry and Mm -hmm. I'm really happy that the people that are putting it together really know how to do this stuff. So it was great. Big thumbs up from me. You're making me very jealous, Mike. I feel like if there's a third one, you've just got to do it, man. It's, it's very, very good, very valuable. Um, and, uh, I like that there is an event for podcasting that focuses on, people that make it and people that enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that that is a really nice thing to exist. And I think that it brings out a group of really interesting, creative people that want to come and see their favorite shows and also care about the craft. And you get to sign a lot of posters. You get to sign a lot of posters too. But you take too long at it. And oh boy, do I have a lot of those posters. I still have so many left because I always overorder because I'm I'm terrified of the thought of not having enough, right? (laughs) So I always order two times the amount that I need, which right. now means I just have this huge box full of last year's posters and this year's posters. I don't know what I'm going to do with them. I was going to say, what are you going to do with them? I have no idea, but I made a promise, right? <laughs> so I, can't, I won't give them away right. because I made a promise yep. that you get them by coming because that is the deal mm-hmm. right? that we all make. So I just have these posters. I don't know. I guess at some point I'm going to have to recycle them, but it just feels sad. So like I feel like I, what's going to happen is... They're just going to keep building up, right? right. That's what's going to happen. These posters spark joy for me. So what am I supposed to do? Okay, I'm going to have some optional homework for the listeners mm-hmm. for this episode. I watched a documentary on Netflix that, that, I, that I feel, I feel is, is Cortex work documentary adjacent. And that documentary was American Meme. I love this name so much. It's it's a great name. So in case it isn't immediately obvious, it's a pun on Amer- the American dream. Yeah. So it's called the American meme. Yeah. It's the documentary just follows the lives and the working lives of people who make a living by being super famous. And I watched it and I was I was kind of like hypnotized and fascinated and then at the end of it i thought like oh this is actually this is actually kind of a cortexy topic 
because in our much smaller ways than Paris Hilton, uh, being known by people we don't know, which is like the definition of fame, is part of this job and part of the industries that we work in. The, mm-hmm. like, the very fact that you can go to a place and people come to see a poster of you on an amazing flying machine, like that is, that is fame. And so uh, I thought it might make for an interesting discussion for us on the show. And so uh, we'll do that next time we record Cortex. So if you, the listener, want to uh, catch American Meme on Netflix before then, uh, you, you can go do so. I feel like it's an easier thing to tell people to watch. Like, I feel like Cortex Movie Club is much more kind on homework than Cortex Book Club. Well, Cortex Book Club is brutal. <laughs> It's punishment for yeah. everybody. <laughs> the, the homework is is the literal definition of homework. It's like right. nobody should want to do it, and it's mostly pointless. Ooh, controversial. Um, <gasps> outrageous. <laughs> outrageous, Mike. <laughs> um, but Cortex Movie Club, I think, is a lot kinder. Uh, yeah. I watched the trailer for this when you told me about it, and I was like, yeah, okay, let's do this. Because the trailer the trailer is very good. Uh, I'll put the trailer, they are on YouTube actually, so I'll put the trailer in the show notes too so people can watch that. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this one. I'm a little bit I'm a little bit apprehensive of it, I will say, just because I've been thinking about social media as I think everybody does today and like how much they want to use it and mm-hmm. I'm not convinced that this, that this is going to make me feel good about my use of social media, but we'll see. Yeah, well, you'll have to find out when you watch it. Mm. Next time. Next time. Cortex Movie Club. On Cortex.